Robert Shaw was a brilliant, hell-raising actor who became famous across the world for his battle with the notorious Great White Shark. But he would face a demon far greater than any shark during the course of his life. In Jaws, Shaw played an eccentric and rugged shark hunter named Quint, who met a horrifying end in the mouth of the man-eater. But while Shaw was shooting the movie that would make him known across the world, he was already in the battle of his life. Soon after the film released, Shaw was dead, destroyed by a different beast which had haunted him since his childhood. Welcome to episode six of Hollywood Mysteries, where we are taking a look at the tragic life of the hell-raising star, Robert Shaw. While filming Jaws, Robert Shaw experienced an alcohol-induced blackout during the iconic SS Indianapolis speech scene. Shaw had suggested to director Steven Spielberg that since the characters in the scene, played by Shaw, Roy Scheider, and Richard Dreyfuss, were drinking, he should have a little drink himself before filming to set the mood. Spielberg agreed, but the decision soon backfired when Shaw drank so much that he needed assistance to return to set. As a result, very little filming was done that day, and Spielberg called it a day by 11 in the morning. Later that night, Shaw, in the state of panic and unable to recall the day's events, had called Spielberg to inquire if he had done anything embarrassing. He also requested a chance to reshoot the scene. The following day, Shaw arrived on set early, completely sober and apologetic, and delivered what would become one of the most iconic speeches in film history. Robert Shaw's reputation is often overshadowed by tales of his excessive drinking, abrasive behavior, and on-set antics. But these stories don't fully capture his skill as an actor and his talent as a writer. Robert Archibald Shaw was born on August 9, 1927, at 51 King Street in West Houghton, Lancashire, England. He grew up in a family with three sisters, Elizabeth, Joanna, and Wendy, and a brother named Alexander. In West Houghton, there were rumors that his parents had married to avoid scandal and legitimize their son. While untrue, this gossip reflected the small town's perception of them as unconventional outsiders. Indeed, they were outsiders. Dr. Thomas Shaw and Doreen Avery married in Truro on April 22, 1926, and Robert was born the following year. Thomas was from the Midlands, with a lineage rooted in Cornwall, leading him back there after qualifying as a doctor in 1924. Doreen Avery's background was equally unconventional. Born in Pig's Peak, Swaziland, where her father worked as a mining engineer, she often proudly claimed to be the only living white Swazi. With aspirations to become a nurse and return to Africa, Doreen moved to Cornwall to be near her sister, enrolling in training at the Royal Cornish Infirmary. It was here in 1925 that she met Thomas setting the stage for their life together and for the birth of their first child, Robert. Doreen was undeniably a striking young woman, tall, slim, and elegant, with a posture that mirrored her straightforward approach to life. Her features perfectly complemented the large brimmed hats that were fashionable at the time. She was defiant of social norms, and she confidently smoked cigarettes in public, an act considered shocking for a woman in those times. She caught the eye of the charismatic and dashing Dr. Thomas Shaw, a man who seemed as if he'd leaped out of a romance novel. Dr. Shaw was hard to resist. He was athletic, tall, dark, and handsome, with an infectious charm and zest for life. However, beneath this exterior was a more complex character, his true nature which would eventually make it difficult for him to cope with life. Thomas was prone to heavy drinking and had a quick temper to match. When Robert was seven, the family relocated to Stromness in Scotland. However, the lifestyle they had in West Houghton quickly resurfaced. Dr. Shaw was respected as a doctor, but his drinking habits, even in a community familiar with alcohol, became a public concern. In a small town with only 2,000 residents, gossip about his drunken behavior spread rapidly, and it negatively impacted his medical practice. At home, Doreen soon realized that her hopes for a better life were fading. 
she faced the reality that her husband's promise to reduce his drinking was empty. If anything, his alcohol consumption increased. Despite his responsibilities as a husband and father, he behaved as if his family didn't matter to him. Doreen reached a point where she considered leaving if things didn't improve. Unfortunately, matters only worsened. In a desperate attempt to show her seriousness, she moved herself and the children into the local pastor's house. As an incomer in Orkney, Robert faced anti-English sentiment from his classmates. He endured bullying, but soon learned to defend himself. Eventually, it was decided that Doreen should move the children to Cornwall, where her sister lived on a farm. Three years after arriving in Stromness, she took her family south, settling into Cherwargan Farm near Laddick with her sister and the Cock family. The Shaws found a very different environment. Robert was enrolled at Laddick Church School, which his cousins attended. The farmhouse, now home to four adults and seven children, was bustling and crowded. In a 1970 BBC Omnibus interview about his childhood, Shaw shared that he remembered his father both drunk and sober. Flamboyant when sober, but troubled when drunk, often ending evenings weeping on his son's bed after drinking. Despite his struggles, Dr. Shaw still had a way with his wife. In 1938, she gave birth to their fifth child, Wendy. However, Thomas Shaw's resolve wavered as he yearned for a family and for his wife to have more children. Yet his need to drink was overwhelming. Robert recalled being hurriedly packed into the car with his siblings, speeding through the countryside while his father spoke of things beyond his understanding. At the Somerset Cliffs, Dr. Shaw would drive close to the edge, asking his eldest son difficult questions on the nature of life and death. According to Robert, this terrifying scenario occurred more than once. In that same year, 1938, despite his promises to Doreen to change, Dr. Shaw passed away. He warned his wife again of his mental state, but she didn't believe him. He retreated to his surgery and ingested a medicine, leaving 11-year-old Robert without a father. Using most of her late husband's estate, Doreen bought a large house in Tresillion, not far from Laddick and her sister's farm. The house, adorned with Virginia Creeper, had a spacious garden backing onto a reservoir. Initially, Shaw returned to Laddick Church School, but in 1939, using the remainder of the estate, a legacy from her father, and additional funds from the Avery family, Doreen sent him to Truro School. He started as a day student and eventually became a boarder, supported by a scholarship that eased the family's financial burden. Robert's recollection of his father's death was muddled. In one account, he was at home when his father declared his awful intent, with his mother pleading for it not to happen in front of the children. In another, he was at school when the headmaster came to inform him. The headmaster offered to drive him home, but Robert chose to stay in class. However, Robert didn't enroll at Truro School until the year after his father's death. And over time, Robert's recounting of the event evolved placing himself increasingly at the center of his father's despair. In later versions, he even confused the manner of his father's death with an unrelated incident at Stromness, where his father had saved two children from drowning. Elwyn Thomas, another school friend of Robert, described him as a philosopher, someone difficult to get close to. Shaw didn't have a best friend or close companions, often displaying moodiness and a pattern of emotional highs followed by lows. He had an air of unapproachability. Shaw's acting prowess was undeniable. John Kendall Carpenter, who later captained England's rugby team, became the headmaster of Wellington School and headed the organization for the Rugby World Cup in 1991. He recognized Shaw's talent early on. Being younger, Kendall Carpenter often played female roles opposite Shaw in school theater productions at the all-boys school and recalled his performance as Mark Antony in 1943 as a great success. Shaw was later praised for his role as Peter Pan, but Kendall Carpenter found Shaw's portrayal of Gripeau and Patrick Hamilton's The Duke of Darkness most powerful. By 1944, Shaw had set his sights on becoming an actor and a writer, encouraged by his success on stage. But with the world at war, there were other pressing matters 
Like many of his peers, Shaw was eager to join the war effort and help the Allies win. The war wasn't just a distant event. It was palpably close. One morning, Shaw and his brother witnessed a Messerschmitt aircraft targeting their house on the main road. The boys watched, transfixed as the plane, unchallenged by local anti-aircraft defenses, approached their home, and the pilot fired the guns before zooming away. Shaw claimed he could see the pilot's face, framed by his helmet and goggles as he flew past their window. In the summer of 1945, Shaw was 18 and seemed a perfect candidate for military service. Given his athletic prowess and robust physical condition, However, his dreams of a military career were dashed when he failed the army medical exam. The reason? Two of his lower back vertebrae were partly fused, causing a persistent back pain he had endured for years and would continue to suffer from. This condition didn't hinder his ability to sprint or score in rugby, but it closed the door on his aspirations for military glory. Shaw briefly worked as a teacher at Glen Howe Preparatory School in Saltburn by the Sea, North Riding of Yorkshire before pursuing his passion for acting. He attended the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in London, graduating in 1948. Shaw's professional acting career began in theater, where he appeared in various regional theaters across England. In 1946, he played Angus in a production of Macbeth at Stratford, spending two seasons with the company. In 1947, Shaw transitioned to television with roles including an appearance in The Cherry Orchard on British TV. He also performed scenes from The Twelfth Night and Macbeth for television audiences. In 1951, Shaw played a minor role as a police laboratory technician in The Lavender Hill Mob. The next year marked his London debut in the West End at the Embassy Theatre in Carol William, followed by a TV appearance in A Time to Be Born. In August 1952, at 22 years old, Shaw married Jennifer Burke in Bulawayo. No parents from either side were present at their wedding. Shaw's eagerness to marry young and quickly start a family mirrored his father's similar preoccupation. Despite the challenges, no stable home, uncertain income, and no job prospects post-tour, Shaw was intent on having a child, a decision that seemed both recklessly optimistic and incredibly driven. This meant Jennifer staying at home with the baby, putting the financial burden solely on Shaw. Yet none of these hurdles seemed to deter Shaw or Jennifer. This period was comparatively happy for Shaw. Alcohol wasn't an issue, mainly because he couldn't afford it. But he cherished time with his baby daughters and Jennifer was a delight to him. Warm, affectionate, kind, and strikingly beautiful. Philip Rodley saw her as an ideal partner for Shaw an earth mother, with the looks of a beauty queen. Shaw was free to live as he pleased, enjoying strong male friendships and being an engaging companion with a great sense of humor and self-confidence. His belief in his own abilities never wavered. 1954 was a challenging year for Shaw. His popularity had waned, especially among the management teams at Stratford and the Old Vic, leading to a dearth of theater work. Dr. Jeremiah Slattery, a friend Shaw had made at a literary event helped him secure some work writing reviews for minor literary journals. However, this gig didn't bring in much income. Most of their financial support that year came from loans, with some assistance from Jennifer's family and friends. But it was a struggle. To add to their troubles, their flat was uncomfortably cold, particularly for Jennifer, who was used to Jamaican warmth, and the bathroom facilities were far from ideal. By the time their daughter Penny was born in October 1954, their financial situation had deteriorated, and Shaw found it increasingly difficult to find people willing to lend him money. The start of 1955 didn't bring much improvement for Shaw at first, even though he now had an agent. It wasn't until May that he landed another acting job, marking a 15th month hiatus since the Antony and Cleopatra tour concluded. His next role, however, was a significant step. Richard Hatton recommended him for the part of the flight sergeant alongside Richard Todd's captain in The Dam Busters, directed by Michael Anderson, with a screenplay by R.C. Sheriff. This film turned out to be the top film in England upon its release that year. 
Shaw's engagement for this role lasted four weeks, and he earned 500 pounds. The role was substantial, though as with previous experiences, much of his performance ended up being cut from the final film. The Dam Busters was a quintessential example of the British war films of that era, marked by a deeply patriotic sentiment, a stiff upper lip attitude, and a tendency towards jingoism. A decade after World War II, the British film industry was still, in a sense, fighting the war through its cinema. The historical accuracy of such films was often questionable. For instance, the narrative of the Dam Busters, which suggested that Barnes Wallace's bouncing bombs devastated Germany's industrial Ruhr Valley and significantly shortened the war has since been proven to be largely exaggerated. But the British public were not flocking to the cinema to indulge in historical accuracy. They had just witnessed the horrors of history firsthand and were far more interested in basking in the glowing aftermath of victory in World War II. Regarding Shaw's casting as Dan Tempest in The Buccaneers, there's a tale that during a screening of the series American Made Pilot, where Alec Clunes played Tempest, and Shaw was a crew member, and an executive dissatisfied with Clunes, demanded the one with balls, referring to Shaw. However, the story is probably as unreliable as the Dam Busters, but it sounded credible, and this reflected Shaw's development into a tough guy actor with a wild reputation for hard living, both on screen and off. Shaw's involvement in the Buccaneers for seven months brought him 200 pounds per episode, plus some expenses, which was a significant sum for him at the time. The role suited Shaw well, allowing him to showcase his physical abilities and strong screen presence. His first speaking role on camera showed not only confidence, but also a natural connection with the camera. Despite this success, Shaw soon confided to friends about his dissatisfaction with the scripts and how he found the whole experience tedious. He often said he was in it just for the money, calling it a pretty depressing business. Shaw's initial response to earning a substantial income was to splurge. He purchased a 1933 Rolls-Royce and a set of golf clubs and took a vacation to Truro, where he proudly showed off his wife, his new car, and his achievements, though not necessarily in that order. He seemed to enjoy flaunting his success, even though he often told friends he resented his work, while simultaneously enjoying the perks it brought. However, Shaw's financial stability was short-lived. The Rolls-Royce was soon sold when the money ran out. Following the cancellation of the Buccaneers, acting opportunities became scarce, leading Shaw to work in a food factory for about a year. Shaw's aspirations in acting were becoming much grander. Like many classically trained actors, he dreamed of commanding the stage at Stratford or the Old Vic, playing iconic Shakespearean roles, much like Richard Burton was doing at the time. Throughout his career, Shaw saw Burton as a rival. Although the two rarely interacted, never worked together, and Burton did not share this view, but it seemed that Burton's success was a motivation for Shaw. By 1957, Shaw had established himself as a TV leading man, starring in TV films like Success and a TV adaptation of Rupert of Hensau. He enjoyed a significant stage success with The Long and The Short and The Tall, in the West End in 1959, which was directed by Lindsay Anderson, and the performance was even filmed for television, though Shaw did not appear in the movie adaptation. Robert Shaw's first novel, The Hiding Place, was a darkly humorous story about two British airmen, Wilson and Connolly, who parachuted behind German lines during World War II. They find refuge with Corporal Frick, who conceals them in his cellar. Living in solitude for much of the war, their rescuer grows fond of their company and deceptively keeps them hidden even after the war ends, leading them to believe the conflict is still ongoing. While in captivity, Wilson discovers a talent for writing, and Connolly is consumed by thoughts of his wife in England and dreams of escape. Her opportunity arises years later when Frick falls ill. The Hiding Place was a hit and was adapted into a film titled Situation Hopeless, but not serious starring Robert Redford and Mike Connors as American pilots, with Alec Guinness playing their captor. Shaw may have been influenced by stories of Japanese soldiers discovered in jungles, still fighting, under the belief that World War II was ongoing. 
The novel also reflects Shaw's own experiences of life before and after the war, including rationing and poverty, as well as a sense of isolation from his time in Orkney. In 1961, Shaw appeared in a Broadway production of Harold Pinter's The Caretaker, with Donald Pleasance and Alan Bates, replacing Peter Whitthorpe, who had performed with them in London. The play ran for 165 performances. Shaw, Pleasance, and Bates later reprised their roles in a film version of The Caretaker. During this period, Shaw's personal life underwent serious changes. He left Jennifer, with whom he had four daughters, and began a relationship with Scottish actress Mary Yore. Yore often called the Scottish Monroe for her blonde hair, was a talented and well-respected actress. Shaw and Mary went on to have four children together, including Colin, whom Shaw adopted. Colin was born in 1961 during Yore's previous marriage to playwright John Osborne, and according to Colin, he was in fact Shaw's biological son from an affair Yore had while still married to Osborne. In the summer of 1963, Shaw returned to Orkney with Mary, who had gained fame as the beleaguered wife in John Osborne's play, Look Back in Anger. Shaw's hair was bleached blonde, a leftover from his role as the villain in From Russia with Love, which she had just completed. In that film, his character meets his end at the hands of James Bond, but off screen, Shaw and Sean Connery were good friends, with Shaw holding high regard for Connery's acting skills. Shaw's role as the assassin Donald Red Grant in From Russia with Love was a major breakthrough in the movie business. He was in danger of being typecast as a villain but this didn't seem to concern him. Shaw commented, I could have been a straight leading man, but that struck me as a boring life. In any case, he was suddenly in huge demand. Offers came in for all kinds of roles, and he was wealthy again. But with wealth, his drinking increased, a habit he shared with Mary. In 1966, the same year, Robert Shaw received an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actor for his portrayal of King Henry VIII and Robert Bolt's A Man for All Seasons. He published his third novel, The Flag, the first in a trilogy. It follows John Calvin, a World War I soldier and miner turned vicar, who stirs controversy with his socialist Christian views in a parish in Eastwold, Sussex. Shaw's socialist and Marxist sympathies were further explored in his play, Caddo Street, which delves into the 1820 attempt by revolutionaries to assassinate British Prime Minister Lord Liverpool and his cabinet. The play featuring Vanessa Redgrave, Bob Hoskins, and James Hazeldean was presented at the Young Vic. Shaw's fourth novel, and the second in his trilogy, The Man in the Glass Booth, was a powerful and controversial piece. He turned it into a successful play that ran in London's West End and on Broadway, starring Donald Pleasance. The novel is an examination of a wealthy Jewish industrialist and Holocaust survivor, Arthur Goldman, who is accused of being a Nazi war criminal. During his trial in Israel, confined in a glass booth for his protection, Goldman confronts and challenges the beliefs of his accusers and reflects on collective guilt for the Holocaust. Shaw returned to Broadway in 1964 with The Physicists, directed by Peter Brook, but it closed after just 55 performances. Shaw expressed his desire to avoid taking on poorly made commercial films for pay, but he was feeling the financial pressures of supporting a large family. He was also facing financial pressures from the IRS and British tax authorities. With this in mind, Shaw relocated to Ireland, which was something of a tax haven at the time. As Shaw aged, his childhood memories, especially his nightmares, became increasingly vivid and constantly present in his daily life. The dominant presence of his father and the haunting image of his tragic passing were ever present. The pattern of highs and lows, first noticed during his school days, became more pronounced. The depressive effects of alcohol made the lows more profound and the highs harder to reach. These childhood experiences, though painful, enriched his acting with a deep understanding of mortality. On the downside, combined with life's trials and tribulations, they contributed to a psychological state that Shaw found challenging to manage. In 1970, Shaw starred in Figures in a Landscape, alongside Malcolm McDowell. The film, a thriller about two escaped prisoners, featured Shaw 
As Matt Conaghy, his performance in this role was well received by audiences and critics. However, it was in 1973 that Shaw's career really pivoted with his role in The Sting. In this film, he played Dowell Lonigan, a formidable gangster. Shaw's portrayal was widely acclaimed and was a major factor in the film's overall success. The Sting went on to win seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture, cementing its place as a classic in cinematic history. It seemed his career was reaching a zenith, and his A-list credentials were being solidified. However, there was still more to come. Curiously, his experience working on many B-movies purely for money would prove invaluable as he found himself being offered a role in the most famous B-movie of all time. Unlike other B-movies, this horror film came with a Hollywood budget and an exciting young director with a reputation for white-knuckle suspense scenes in his films, Steven Spielberg. In 1975, Robert Shaw took on what would become his most memorable role in the blockbuster Jaws. He played Quint, the season's shark hunter. Initially, Shaw wasn't too keen on accepting the role. It was only after considerable persuasion from his wife, Mary Yur, that he agreed to do it. He feared it would be just another horror film that would be forgotten weeks after it was released. But there was big money backing this one, so he decided to go for it. Even so, things got off to an inauspicious start. Their arrival at Martha's Vineyard, where the film was shot, was met with an unusual incident. Robert, Mary, and their assistant, Eric Harrison, settled into their provided rental home, expecting a peaceful first night. However, late that evening, they were startled when a local, mistaking the house for being empty, shot several bullets through the front door, damaging walls and even chipping bathroom tiles. Harrison, responding with a mix of surprise and calm, humorously noted the situation. I believe they're shooting, sir. The person responsible was later fined and then released. Apart from this bizarre welcome, Shaw faced another challenge. He had to frequently leave the US when not filming due to unresolved tax issues with the IRS. Moreover, he didn't earn enough money from his role in Jaws. It all went straight to the tax man. The role itself demanded long hours in cold water, often interacting closely with Bruce the notorious animatronic shark. And Shaw was boozing harder than ever. Shooting Jaws wasn't entirely unpleasant for Shaw. He found some lighthearted moments, especially in his interactions with co-star Richard Dreyfus. Shaw's constant teasing led to some entertaining bets, one of which was daring Dreyfus to leap from the top of their ship, the Orca's Mast. Spielberg made a risky move in helping Shaw shape his character, Quint. He introduced Shaw to Craig Kingsbury, a local from Martha's Vineyard, where the film was shot on location. Kingsbury didn't just inspire Shaw's portrayal of Quint. He also appeared in the film as the ill-fated fisherman, Ben Gardner. Shaw and Kingsbury hit it off immediately, discovering a mutual love of drinking in the daytime. They were often spotted strolling down Main Street in Edgartown, laughing boisterously, resembling a pair of merry, inebriated sailors. Some of Kingsbury's quirky expressions were directly included in the script by Carl Gottlieb. One memorable line goes, it looks like a kitty scissor class has cut it up for a paper doll. Reflecting on the production challenges of Jaws, director Steven Spielberg explained that casting the role of Quint was particularly tough. He considered several actors before settling on Robert Shaw, a choice which did not thrill the producers who were wary of Shaw's drinking and hell-raising ways. Spielberg initially wanted Lee Marvin for the role of Quint. However, he discovered Marvin was more interested in the prospect of a fishing trip than the film itself. This led Spielberg to Shaw, and this turned out to be a stroke of luck for the film. Critics and audiences unanimously agreed that Shaw was the ideal Quint. He brought a certain rawness and authenticity to the character, transforming what could have been a comical role into an unforgettable legendary figure in cinema. His dramatic introduction, Screeching Nails on a Chalkboard, sets the stage for his intense fixation on hunting a giant shark. Robert Shaw's meticulous attention to every line is crucial. Without it, Quint might not have been as captivating. His character's obsession with hunting the deadly shark borders on the extreme. Yet Shaw's performance grounds it in a way that feels logical, even when it skirts the edges of the outlandish. 
Jaws itself became a massive hit and is hailed as a classic. Many of Quinn's lines in the film were actually improvised by Shaw, including his contribution to the renowned USS Indianapolis monologue. Shaw's son, Ian, recalled the monologue initially being, as he described it, insanely long. It underwent numerous revisions by various writers, including Shaw himself, whose four-minute adaptation ultimately made it into the movie. He was a good writer, Ian says. Because the shark was broken for so long, they were all improvising and talking and trying to make the script better. The first version was not great. Certainly, that's how Robert felt. Shaw dedicated nine intense weeks to filming the final 40 minutes of Jaws, mostly confined to a boat off of Martha's Vineyard. During this time, the atmosphere was often tense, particularly between Shaw and his younger co-star, Richard Dreyfus, as well as with Roy Scheider. Shaw and Dreyfus frequently engaged in heated off-camera debates that sometimes escalated to violence. Despite these confrontations, there was a private respect between Shaw and Dreyfus. Shaw wasn't actually antagonistic towards Richard. Rather, he awkwardly tried to mentor him, urging him to focus more on his craft than on the cult of fame. Shaw's onset boozing was also a challenge for his co-stars and crew. There was an incident where Dreyfus, in a well-meaning but naive attempt to curb Shaw's drinking, threw his liquor overboard. This gesture, however, only aggravated the situation, leading to an even tenser standoff between the two actors. Alcohol itself plays a role in Jaws as a kind of motif, mirroring the increasing peril of the water around the characters. Throughout the movie, the characters frequently turn to alcohol. This is evident in scenes like Brody's wife suggesting they get drunk and fool around. The awkward wine scene leading to the dissection of a shark and Quint's iconic Indianapolis story, told over drinks. The presence of alcohol is constant, from Brody's whiskey glass while spending time with his child, to the opening scene's inebriated character unable to follow the woman into the water. The film uses alcohol as an ironic symbol of the character's attempt to escape the looming aquatic danger. The filming of Jaws notoriously stretched 100 days beyond its planned schedule, causing the budget to skyrocket from 4 million to 9 million. A significant reason for this overrun was the frequent malfunctioning of the three mechanical sharks, collectively named Bruce, which were of course a crucial part of the shoot. The sharks often broke down because they were tested in fresh water during pre-production, but the saltwater environment of the ocean proved to be their undoing. Despite these production challenges, Jaws achieved phenomenal success raking in 477 million globally at the box office and earning four Oscar nominations, including one for Best Picture. Though his character only appears in the second half of the film, Shaw's performance makes Quint unforgettable. His delivery of each line, his intense gaze, and his portrayal of the character's journey all contributed to making Quint an iconic figure in cinema. Jaws became a sensation for many reasons, but Spielberg's casting of Shaw as Quint, capturing the perfect essence for the character, was undoubtedly a key factor in its success. But his freedom to enjoy the success was about to be seriously curtailed by a series of events that would lead to his own death. Away from Jaws, this year was a challenging one for Shaw. Mary, his wife, also struggled with alcohol dependency and mental health issues in the early 1970s. Tragically, on April 2nd, 1975, just hours after a successful opening night of the exorcism on stage in London, Mary was found dead at their home by Shaw. She was only 42 and had accidentally overdosed on alcohol and barbiturates. The exorcism was in fact an adaptation of the notorious 1973 movie, The Exorcist. The film had already gained a reputation as cursed with many who were associated with it having passed away in mysterious or tragic circumstances. It did not take long for the press to sensationalize Mary's death as being a part of this curse. However, the true horror was Robert having to discover the lifeless body of the woman he loved and mother to their four young children. She had returned home from the party that followed the play's opening night, having had a few drinks. She took her prescription medication for depression, but was, as often, somewhat careless with the dose. On this occasion, a drunken oversight proved sadly fatal. 
Despite this personal tragedy, Shaw continued to prove his acting skills. In 1976, he appeared in Robin and Marion, playing the Sheriff of Nottingham alongside old friend Sean Connery and Audrey Hepburn. This romantic adventure film offered a new take on the Robin Hood story. Shaw married his third and final wife, Virginia Jansen, in 1976. The couple had a son, Thomas, and Shaw also adopted Virginia's son, Charles, from her previous relationship. This period of Shaw's life was also marked by his role in Black Sunday, where he portrayed an Israeli Mossad agent. Directed by John Frankenheimer, this thriller centered around a plot to stage a terrorist attack at the Super Bowl. In 1978, Shaw took on the role of Romer Treese, a treasure hunter in The Deep, a movie based on Peter Benchley's novel, who also authored Jaws. This adventure film was admired for its stunning underwater cinematography and was a box office hit. But there was a growing darkness in his life, and it was alcohol that filled it. The trauma of the loss of his father never left him, and the loss of Mary only exasperated his suffering. And the circling wolves from the IRS amplified his stress to intense levels. Now his body was ready to give up. Tragically, Shaw's life was abruptly cut short in 1978, just three years after his wife's passing. While filming Avalanche Express, a movie co-starring Lee Marvin, Shaw suffered a fatal heart attack. He was driving with Virginia in Ireland when he felt unwell. After pulling over and stepping out of the car for air, Shaw suddenly collapsed and passed away almost immediately. As the film was still in production, his voice was later overdubbed by actor Robert Rieti. Shaw's death at the age of 51 was a tremendous loss to the film industry, marking the end of a career of a remarkably talented and complex individual. He was not only an extraordinary actor, but also an exceptional writer whose ambition and personal struggles fueled his creative output. Ridley Scott in the DVD commentary for Gladiator lamented that actors like Shaw, Richard Harris, and Oliver Reed were now essentially extinct in the film industry. Moreover, he was a generous father to a large family who felt his loss greatly. Ultimately, his demons proved to be too powerful. He was cremated and his ashes scattered in Termakiti, Ireland. So that wraps up our look into the fascinating and tragic but hell-raising life of Robert Shaw. I hope you enjoyed listening. If you would like more rainy tales from the dark side of Tinseltown, feel free to subscribe to the channel. Until next time, it's good night from Hollywood Mysteries. Sweet dreams.